Hey, everybody, thanks so much for coming. It's 12.15, so I'm just about to start for, I think I have till 12, like 55 or something. Hey, Liz. So about 40 minutes. Um, and I'm going to talk about software and space. By the way, fantastic job you guys did just now. I'm just geeking out. I'm still kind of coming down from that buzz of just seeing, seeing you guys talk about hardware. And you said there was another session you had today at 3.45 or something? Or? Do you know what the title of that is? Just, uh, just for us space nerds. I don't know the exact title, but it's about confidence Great. Coding, confidential computing, I think. Great. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks very much for coming, everybody. Um, so let's get going. Ah, darn it! I've got some pop-ups. I'm going to get rid of. It wouldn't be a tech conference without me getting some. Great. Okay. Cool. So that's me. That's a picture of me drinking a cup of coffee. Uh, that's me on the platform formerly known as Twitter. Um, sorry. Um, and uh, I work for IBM. All views are my own. So if I say something that annoys you, it's my fault. It's not IBM's fault. Um, I work on a number of open source projects. I work with uh, Liz Joseph, who's here from IBM as well, um, a project called the Open Mainframe Project. And um, one of my passions is just absorbing knowledge and being at the kind of bleeding edge where things that I knew are all of a sudden tipped upside down and that book that I read is now just basically just a, a paperweight and there's a few uh, areas where that's really being kind of advanced by, by humans right now and one of them is definitely software and space. So that's what I've come to talk about today. Um, and I first gave this talk actually um, at an astronomy club which was great because I just loved it and they ripped me to shreds. So you've got mark two of the talk. So, um, what I'm going to do now is try and press the mouse and make it work. Here we are. I'm going to talk about a number of, come on, be nice to me, talk about a number of space missions. And these space missions for me highlight things, uh, uh, there's a little bit of storytelling in them uh, about the particular space missions and what happened to them and things that I think are quite sort of didactic uh, for us to take into our day jobs, which might necess not necessarily be putting probes into space. I'll talk about the Ariane 5 mission, Cassini-Huygens, which was a, a mission to explore Saturn and its moons. And I'm going to end up talking about the Mars Orbiter and Mars Probe. Okay. Um, folks, how many folks? There's some folks who probably weren't alive in 1996, were they? Um, so I was. I was alive in 1996. Um, and this is the Ariane 5 rocket in French Guiana on the launch pad, um, ready for its maiden voyage. The folks who weren't around in 1996, in the UK charts, Killing Me Softly was number one. In the US charts, I had to Google for this one. I didn't even know what it was. Bone, Thugs and Harmony Crossroads. Any, any, any fans of that? No? Maybe it was a one-hit wonder. I, you, you got that, yeah. OK. Um, here we are, just putting it back into perspective. So, and Ariane 5 was, took a decade to develop. It cost 7 billion US dollars in money at that point in time. And it's a maiden launch of Ariane 5, and it was putting four satellites into space. We'll talk a little bit more about that now. Um, and I think I have a video. Let's see if the video is going to play. What? There's no audio coming out, is there? You can hear? It's a bit soft. OK, I could fast forward it if you want. So what we have is we have that very nice French man we saw at the start with his Wonderful glasses. We have Ariane 5 on the launch pad. He counts down in French. There's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And there it goes. That, that thing's heading up into space. Um, it's putting, uh, I'll talk a bit more about orbits later, uh, the sort of purpose of that mission. It's basically, uh, it's got a thrust to weight ratio of 1.8. And it's got a burn time of about 130 seconds. And that's going to basically get those four orbits up into what's called GTO, which is uh, an, an orbit, um, where a temporary orbit, where orbits are put into. It's also got a second phase, and uh, it goes bang. Okay, 39 seconds into the launch, uh, the thing explodes. Fireball, that's $7 billion. This has gone up in smoke. Oh, thanks. Did you jack up the audio a bit? Thank you, sir. And my favorite bit about this video, that's on YouTube and you can look, is that face. You can't quite see it. I just, that's the, the meme of the, 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 what just happened. Just in case the video didn't quite work, there's a few little stills here I've got showing it. 
Okay. So basically, uh, how did that happen? So let's, let's take us back to 1996 and what's going on at the point in time. So I'm just going to nerd out a little bit on space orbits and satellites. Um, so that's Earth in the middle, and primarily uh, orbits are split into three different orbits. Uh, you have what's called the uh, LEO, or the Low Earth Orbit. The Low Earth Orbit, generally satellites in there orbit the uh, Earth about, about 12 times a day. So that's where telecommunication satellites tend to sit, the international space stations tend to sit, and things like that. Okay? Um, and they're basically a, a circular orbit. They don't necessarily go around the pole, you know, the equator. Some of them have a, a, a you know, some of them literally go north-south, and depending on what the orbits, depending on what the purpose of that satellite is, okay? That's a low Earth orbit. Um, to get into low Earth orbit, you actually need to be going at about 28,000 kilometers an hour, okay? So one of the things, and sorry if I'm, I don't want to mansplain people in the room, people a lot smarter than me who work in this field, but basically if you look at a rocket, when I was a child, I, I never really understood what escape velocity was. I thought, you throw a ball in the air and it comes back down, and if you throw it hard enough, it's just going to get into interstellar space. That's not what happens, okay? So to get, a, to get something into orbit, you go up, but then you go sideways as well. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to escape falling into Earth's gravity. So um, you have two uh, apparent pieces of acceleration. You have the centripetal, which is the gravitational force pulling you into, into the body that's got the higher mass, which in this case is planet Earth. And you need to make sure, so it's kind of like a vector where you're going down there, but you also need to make sure that you match that with what your apparent centrifugal acceleration. It's still an acceleration, even though it's constant speed because it's change of velocity. Okay? And once those two are basically balanced, you're in orbit, okay? And the closer you are to Earth, the more speed you need to do that. Anybody who's sort of sat there and, you know, watched something going around a plug hole, you know, you realize it speeds up and it gets to the center. It's basically the same, the same math, okay? Um, just to put things in perspective, kilometers an hour, I'm, I'm in the US now, so I should try and, it's 90 times the speed of the Japanese bullet train. <clears throat> it's fast, okay? Um, you also have, at the point in time in 1996, a lot of orbits were going um, much further out. The GPS, Global Positioning System, is a, a Middle Earth orbit, which is about uh, twice as far, well, halfway into the geostationary orbit, or the GTO, is it? the GEO is it sometimes. But the geostationary orbit will basically effectively orbit uh, with a fixed point on planet Earth. So if you have a a satellite dish and you want to point it and you don't want to have to keep moving it because the object you're pointing at is moving around, you know, that's awkward and uh, so it's nice if you can just put, stick it in the sky and it stays there and you, you point something, you can have a nice tasty communication with it. Okay, and then much, much further out as well. Okay, interestingly in those further orbits, um, uh, you actually have a, a lower velocity. You're actually about 11,000 kilometers an hour as opposed to 28, which comes from an interesting conundrum. I don't want to geek out too much and waste of time, but if you have a satellite in a, in a, in a low orbit and you want to get it to a higher orbit, uh, you actually slow it down, first of all, to get it to the right speed. Then you thrust it up into the higher orbit, which is sort of not counterintuitive. If you just speed it up, it's just going to go flying off into, into, into space. Um, okay. Um, the escape velocity to actually get into interplanetary space is actually about, uh, about 40,000 kilometers an hour. Okay, so there was a big race going on at this point in time. The space shuttle hadn't yet been, had its, when the space shuttle's made a launch, like 81 or something, or, I can't, anyway, the space shuttle hadn't yet been, been completed by NASA. So the European Space Agency were really trying to build the biggest, biggest rockets in time for this. And it went bang. Um, the reason it went bang is because the engineers didn't know how to count. Okay. Fundamentally, you're holding your breath for that. Uh, sorry, sorry, Liz, I couldn't resist putting the so on the seat. So fundamentally, and I'll talk more about the failure. So what basically happened was, folks in the room know how to store numbers, right? I mean, again, I don't want to mansplain you all, but basically binaries, you know, ones and zeros and things. 16-bit um, um, integer can only basically go up to uh, you know, 65,000, okay? If, if you sign it, it's going to come down a little bit. And if you go to floating point, and you know, it's going to come down even more because you need the exponent and the mantissa and things like that. Um, it was around the time, um, back in the 1990s, people were moving from sort of 16 to 32 to 64-bit computing. 64-bit number is awfully large, okay? 
Let me see if you've got number. So what you had in the Ariane 5 is 39 seconds after the launch, the rocket self-destructed. What basically happened was there were two systems on the rocket. One was built by ESA, one was built by the European Space Agency, um, and the other one was built by NASA. And what happened is the inertial guidance system, which is basically measuring the tilt of the rocket, how much it's tilting, so of course, as opposed to going on the attitude it wanted to. The sideways velocity was 64-bit, was computed in 64 bits. Okay, so that particular component was a 64-bit. That particular component was sending that number to a something that was expecting a 16-bit signed integer. The 16-bit signed integer overflowed. Okay? Seven billion dollars worth just went up in smoke. It set the space mission back, it set, set back um, about four years um, before they got their next launch. Okay, it's the largest, most expensive software bug. So we're gonna look at why that occurred. What can we learn? What lessons can we learn from this? <clears throat> so the basic lesson is that they reused the software component. So this is a history of the Ariane rocket that actually starts in about 1979. And if you can look, there's numbers here, and I'll see which ones are interesting to me, is basically the amount of payload that it can take gets bigger. Right, it's just a bigger firecracker. Right, it's Newton's second law. The more, the more fuel, the bigger you can make it. Pfft, burn all that hot stuff out the back, and you're going to get a thrust taking you into orbit. Ariane 4 was basically able to take a payload mass of 4.9 metric tons, roughly double to Ariane 5, 11. If you're going to get four satellites into GS, GTO orbit, which then they, the satellites themselves boost into the geostationary, the high orbit, um, th that's what you basically need to get that bad boy into space. Okay. That's more thrust than the space shuttle ever had, by the way. Now, the component that was developed was developed for Ariane 1, Ariane 2, Ariane 3, Ariane 4, Ariane 5. Ariane 5 is bigger and faster, and it's got more poke than Ariane 4. So, so the lesson is that the software bug is because if you take a component that you've developed or a piece of software that you've constrained, created with one set of constraints, and you try to reuse that, somewhere else, and you don't go back and look at the original design specifications for it, uh, you're in for a world of hurt, right? And this is especially true with an open source today. If you look at people's, uh, you know, software bill of materials and all packet managers like, you know, Python or even Java to a certain extent, and known things, the amount of software that I come across where people just glibly pull in packages that pull in packages that pull in packages, and then eventually you might come back down to something that you just trust because it's always been there, right? Like a log4j or a, rc.js or fakers.js or something like that. And these all have flaws and these all get attacked as well because the world we live in is massively increasing. Your bandwidth gets faster, you know, the threat actors get faster. Um, everything's changing. Don't take for granted that something that used to work is still going to work for you. And don't take for granted as well with open source, I'm going a bit open source didactic here, that just because of an open source package is used by Google and Facebook and Amazon and you know, Microsoft and, you know, IBM for whatever, obviously not as big as those companies are now, um, that, that means you can trust it, right? Just, just look at everything, look at the original specs. And it's one thing I like about open source, you can crawl over all of that and do your own. Okay. Ariane 6 hasn't yet been developed. Ariane 5. Um, the, most, the worst thing about this launch as well is that particular component that was counting up that number to 64 bits wasn't even needed after launch. It was only needed to make sure that the thing didn't wobble on the gantry. That system didn't even need to be running, okay? I mean, the, the, so there's the whole story. story about, and that's why, that's, why, that's why that person had that phase. Here we are. So understand numbers. I'm still astonished by the people that I come across in IT who don't understand numbers. I love the fact that not everybody has a maths degree. My degree isn't maths. But sometimes we need to go back to the basics. We need to understand the difference between integers floating points, decimals, um, software use isn't always good, understand demons, understand things that are running in your computer before you do something. I sometimes um, debug problems where there's literally things go, oh, something's running slow, and I'm like, yeah, it's running slow because you've got all these weird things running and polling and pinging, and maybe you don't need them, right? Maybe they need it in debug mode. Maybe they need it in test mode, and you talked about that. Um, uh, so sort of ultra ping that, where you actually create your own denial of service, okay? And don't give up. Ariane 5, a very, very successful rocket. Um, it actually had um, over 100 successful launches. And in December 2021, um, one of its last launches, it put the James Webb Telescope 
in space. So NASA eventually trusted it to basically get that bad boy up in space, which is currently out there in Lagrange Point 2, doing some amazing, amazing science. OK, cool. So the next mission I'd like to look at, any quick questions on Ariane 5 as well? No? OK. The tiniest, most um, you know, elementary things about not understanding numbers brought the thing down. I've got loads of other, I won't talk too much, but like code pages. If you're ever into computing, storing text, understand code pages. Um, you know, please, please understand the difference between ASCII and UTF code pages. I was in Sweden recently visiting a bank. Sweden has 29 letters in their alphabet. The bank got sued because they, on the GDPR, they sent um, bank statements out to somebody and he was, and I'm sort of slightly paraphrasing the name, like, you know, Gunther de Heldborgen, you know, he had this wonderful blend of, you know, Flemish name and, uh, you know, it was the wrong name on his address label. And, uh, and uh, you know, he was able to sue, sue the bank for a lot of money. And it's because there was a piece of software that had been written by somebody that didn't understand, uh, you know, code pages. And, and especially when you get into sort of like Turkey and some, some of the um, Asian language double byte character sets and stuff, please understand what that number, what that means, uh, and what that means to um, the rocket or, or the customer that you're mailing a billing statement to. Saturn is, I mean, Saturn is, a, Saturn is a really, really interesting planet. So it's the sixth planet in our solar system. It's the second largest after Jupiter. It's a gas giant. It's about nine and a half times the size of Earth. The most interesting for, thing for me about the gas giants are that they, both, they radiate more thermal energy than they consume from the sun. Right, so they're, they're not a sun in that they haven't got sort of nuclear fusion going on um, within their core. Um, but they're still a nice, warm, interesting thing to study. And Saturn has an awful lot of moons. I think it's got like almost 200 or something. Um, but the biggest one is called Titan. And Titan is actually about the same size as Mercury. So it's, it's, it's a big thing in our solar system, right? We always focus on the planets, but some of the moons are really interesting. There's some phenomenal, especially Jupiter's got some really interesting moons as well, like Europa, which is a wonderful ice-covered moon that potentially harbors life, right? And, 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 and within some form, whatever that means. So what's really interesting is about Titan is that um, Titan has an atmosphere, not unlike planet Earth. Our atmosphere is primarily sort of, you know, nitrogen and, um, you know, oxygen and argon, a little bit too much CO2 at the moment. Um, even though that's still a tiny proportion, it still has a very negative effect in being a greenhouse warming gas. Titan is a methane-based atmosphere, okay? So that's C2H4, so it's methane-based. So, so it's not, and people have been pointing telescopes at it ever since it was first discovered, and they can't see inside it. They can't see squiddly squat, right? It's, a big, it's always a cloudy day on Titan. So NASA were launching a, a probe to Saturn to do a lot of exploration of Saturn and its moons uh, called Cassini. <clears throat> and um, the European Space Agency said, well, this is cool, so let's use this opportunity to actually dump something into Titan's atmosphere, to descend into the atmosphere, and go underneath the clouds and um, have a look around. You know, so let's see what's happening. And that sounds like a pretty fun space mission. So that, that that's, was, it's also known as Cassini-Huygens probe. So Cassini is that big, big mothership that's flying around. And then um, Huygens is basically going to drop down and do a descent. OK? Right? So the mission was launched in 1997. I think it got there in 2004. So it's about a seven-year mission. Okay, and there's a wonderful diagram at the bottom of uh, like slingshot, slingshotting, slingshotting, I have to try to say that with a um, dry mouth. So slingshotting is really interesting. So once you get into interstellar orbit, so you have your escape velocity from Earth, which is like 40,000 kilometers an hour, you're basically in free space. But, but what you can actually do, uh, slingshotting is a really in interesting technique where you, you, you go towards a planet and you accelerate. So imagine you, you throw something and, you, and it's going to get quicker and quicker, but you're moving and then the planet's moving. So you kind of just miss it and it drags you in. You come flying around the other side. That's called orbital slingshot. And what a lot of probes do is they launch and you actually launch towards the inner solar system first. You try and get a slingshot off of somewhere like Mercury, come back around to Earth, come back around to Earth. I think there was a double slingshot of Mars to get the probe. I mean, there's phenomenal mass, and then boom, you basically make it. Um, a lot of firsts on this probe. It was definitely the most heavy thing to go into space. It's also powered by plutonium de decay. So plutonium decay, I think plutonium has atomic weight of, I think chemists in the room, I think it's like, is it? Anyway, let's say plutonium is 238. I think that might be the uranium. Anyway, so the decay of it, you're basically just kicking out neutrons at the back. I mean, that's your pr propulsion system to get you there. Um, and... The idea, 
the idea, the design point, was that when Cassini uh, gets close to Titan, basically it dumps Titan, Titan is unpowered, drops into the atmosphere, heat shield, heat shield pops off, descend, opens a parachute, it's about two and a half hours of descent and all these wonderful sensors go out. So four years into the mission, keep a little time check for me, um, this man basically had a, had a concern. So Boris Sems is from the European Space Agency, he's a test engineer. Right, I love test. I love testers. Right, and uh, he just looks. Like, I love the fact he's got TCPA people on his back show, book, book, bookcase as well. Um, he just wasn't comfortable with the fact that they'd never tested this ever before. They've never. So this Huygens craft is going down, and it has a very small battery, and it just has two and a half hours before it's basically just dead. Right, it's just basically debris. Um, it quite clearly, well, it can't transmit back in real time to. Uh, to Earth, that's a long way away, right? It's about eight minutes, I think, is basically speed of light to just get to Earth. Um, well, depending on where Saturn and Earth are in their relative orbits around the Sun. Um, so the Cassini has got a nine, three meters, about a nine foot dish on it. So what happens is it has to basically just talk to Cassini, which is basically very close by. Cassini collects all that data, and then in its own time, you know, Cassini can store it all and just dump it back to Earth, and the scientists can do their magic. Um, he just wasn't comfortable with a single point of failure. So he basically wanted to do a test, and the test he wanted to do was simulate that separation condition, because Cassini's now flying about Mach 120 through space. Uh, he said, I just want to orient, orient Cassini back to Earth, because now we're separating from Earth, and imagine that Earth is Huygens and Cassini. Anyway, he managed to do the science. It took him seven months to convince his management that this experiment was needed. It cost $5,000 to this experiment, yeah? Okay. Um, and there was four years of mission left. And it all went wrong. It all broke. Everything failed. And when engineers sat down is, again, I come back to the sort of learn how to count. Folks know what the Doppler shift is. Okay, Doppler shift. We were taught this at school, but it's fundamentally, if you, are, if you have something that's a wave um, and you're moving towards the source of the wave, the wave is going to be compressed. If you're moving away from the source of the wave, the wave is going to be elongated, right? And that's why you have a little picture of an ambulance driving towards somebody and it goes, doo -doo -doo -doo, and then it goes, doo -doo -doo -doo, as it goes. That was a really bad impression of an ambulance anyway. The Doppler effect affects lots of different things. Now, the way Cassini Huygens was the first mission ever in space that was using this in interstellar space. So satellites use this, uh, digital communication to communicate to Earth. But everything else that ever got that far in space, you know, the Voyagers and the Pioneers, they're not using digital comms, they're using analog communication, okay? Right. Digital communication, uh, basically phase shift modulated signal, what you've got is you need to work out where the ones and the zeros are, right, to basically transmit data. Um, so you have a one is when you, so you have basically a referencing that's going tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock um, on both the Cassini and the Huygens probe, both the receiver and the transmitter, and then your wave is basically, you're doing phase shift modulated signal and going, oh yeah, beep, beep, those two are line, I have a one, beep, beep, those two are off, I've got a zero, okay? Or you can flip it the other way around, it doesn't really matter which, as long as you're aligned. And then those two things are synchronized every so often, you reset them all, right? So you have atomic clocks, you have a clocks on both of the things resetting them all. But what you've got with Cassini Huygens is because the thing is dropping down with a separation speed of about, was well, at Mach 120 in space, it would have been about Mach 26. Um, what's happening is you've got two things moving apart very, very fast, right? So even though they're using light, at light speed, at the kind of separation speeds you're talking about, that makes a big difference. Because what's going to happen, imagine two cogs and two cogs are meshing together and you sort of take a blowtorch and you heat one of them up. They're going to be okay, and then it's all going to get a bit mangled. You're going to end up losing your data. They were going to end up losing 80% of their packets of data. Because what they didn't realize, now these two components were talking, they realized that the frequency would change. So the transmission frequency and the receiving frequency were different. But they didn't realize that the wavelengths would change. Again, this is a schoolyard error, right? They didn't realize that the wavelengths would change. So the engineers were like, great. We're just going to send up a fix. We're going to send up a software fix. The component that they had was unable to be patched. The component that they had was developed for low Earth orbit satellites that only have a velocity of about 11,000 miles an hour, right? So, actually, no, low Earth, sorry, 
maybe up to about 30,000, 30,000 kilometers an hour, I'm sorry. So this mission is doomed. There is nothing they can do. Um, they rescued it. And the way they rescued it was they slowed the Cassini probe down. So what they actually had to do, and you can see this a little bit from here, they, instead of doing, they're doing orbit A, that's a big Cassini probe orbiting, they're slowing, they're physically slowing down the, the, the Cassini probe. Second orbit, then on the third orbit, they lob, <laughs> they lob the Titan space probe for three weeks, unpowered at Titan. Just lob this thing, unpowered at Titan, has to get sucked into Titan's gravitational field. Remember, it's quite big, it's as big as Mercury. You've got Saturn, not far behind, right? So there's an awful lot that can go wrong here. And then as it descends, what you've got to do, again, if you're running alongside the ambulance, or, right, it doesn't, what they basically did, even though this thing, they managed to slow it down to about Mark 7, and they managed to basically make it so, as Huygens is descending into the atmosphere, the line of sight is basically parallel. Because you haven't got separation speed, you, you're now parallel. It's a bit like when, when I was a kid, I used to ride to school on, on open top buses in London, if you had them in the US. You know, the way you, get, the way you get on a bus is you run alongside it and get up to the speed, and then you kind of hop on. And the way you get off it safely is you kind of hop off and keep on running. Okay, your separation velocity is lower. Um, anyway, this was something that I pulled up, which was basically how they effectively showed to do it. So they're flying past it. I'm running out of time. I was going to show a video. Um, I don't think I will. Anyway, there's a cute little video. Maybe. Let's see, can I I'll show you some of the pictures they got? What's really cool is the planet basically has uh, lakes on it. It has rocks. I love the fact that they actually see, you can see the shadow as it lands. Just there, what? Maybe you can't, maybe it was a bit too subtle, but as you can see the shadow of the parachute landing. Okay, and that thing was all caught. So it was, it was a success. Um, what can we take home from here? Single point of failure. If you've got something that's gonna go wrong, it probably will if you haven't tested it before. Management and development teams communicate in a safe space. I see this all the time on software where basically developers are passive aggressive against managers. We can take, you know, we can't all just slag off managers off. It's not all, they're not all like Dilbert type people. Um, but we need to have a safe space to communicate and air concerns. Um, Boris Sems was about to retire and he, was about, he said, if this doesn't go well, I will give you $5,000 for my retirement fund. Right? He just saved a seven, <laughs> I forgot what it cost. Anyway, he saved some enormous amount of space. Um, I love the last one. The best way to solve a problem is avoid it. I get this a lot in software, where if, you're, if your problem is, is, is dot plus separation shift, which is to do with two bodies moving apart, just make them not move apart. I see people trying to fix defects where I'm like, well, you could just disable that button or you could just use a different metaphor or you could just not do that thing. Sometimes it's very easy to get so dear in the headlights when we're, when we're doing something with software that we think, you know what, let's just make that situation just never occur because we don't actually make that possible. We just, we just um, and, and that's, that's something about pride about solving problems, but flying past, I've, I haven't got much time left. How long do I have left? I think I've got, let me just check the schedule. Sorry for being a little bit. I think I was going to end. Oh, about 10 minutes left. Okay. Any questions then on Cassini Huygens? It was a success. By the way, the fact that those pictures are in sepia and they're not in color was because one other user error occurred, which is that they had two communication channels and they sent the wrong instruction set and they balked one of the communication channels. So they had to deliberately say, we're just going to remove all color and we're going to turn it into sepia. So it's actually a really colorful planet and they'll never know. One engineer, and that was a hub. The same thing was, I think, balked one of the pioneer probes as well. There's quite a lot of things where people just make the wrong instruction set again. Somebody's typing a hyphen. This is Mars, okay? Mars is a um, beautiful planet, lots going on on Mars. You talked a little bit about Mars in the helicopter. So what I'm gonna talk a little bit about here is I'm gonna come for the Lars Mars Climate Orbiter. Okay, this was a pair of missions um, that were sent up by NASA. Um, they were basically sent on the, same, on the same launch vehicle, so they were basically sent to space at the same time. But they had different purposes, one of which was a satellite, which is going to monitor the climate. And not far behind, about three weeks behind, was basically a probe that was going to land onto, onto Mars and basically do some, do some science on Mars. Okay? Especially looking to see if uh, any water 
they had been on, on Mars, okay? Because there was already data being fed back uh, that was, there was a possibility of water, not just geologically looking at photographs, but you know, there was some science coming back as well. It all went horribly wrong, okay? So what happened was the Mars Climate Orbiter was coming in first, so this is kind of the first to kind of scout to go out and get into orbit first to guide the second craft in. And um, the scout basically uh, just bounced off the atmosphere. Um, it's either in a heliocentric orbit, it's either somewhere stuck orbiting the sun, uh, or else it's basically cratered on Mars. Uh, nobody quite knows where it is. Um, and the basic problem to do with this was that, um, again, numbers. The, the, the thrust receiver wanted newtons, which is a metric unit of measure, um, published by um, JPM, Jet Propulsion um, Laboratory, and Lockheed Martin, who provided the probe, off-the-shelf probe, coming back to off-shelf probe, um, they were like, uh, well, I'm going to give it to you in pound four seconds. The difference is four and a half times, okay? So basically, the, the, the last instruction that they sent to this thing as they were flying it in was to generate um, four and a half times the amount of thrust that they needed to. The thing just went boom, just zing straight off the Mars atmosphere. Because they didn't understand, it comes back to that first lesson, they didn't, if you look at a number in isolation, but you don't know what that number means, how big it can get, how small it can get, how volatile it is, it, you're basically guessing, second guessing. So they lost this, they lost this probe. It's gone. Now the next thing comes in, three weeks later, here comes the lander, the lander comes in. The lander doesn't have the probe to guide it, with the, if, the, if the satellite was there, it could have done near real-time communication back to Earth, because it would have been the relay station to talk back to Earth. So it has to rely on backup communication, which has a, a latency of about, about an hour, actually, by the time they sent the instruction that got actually encoded and executed and stuff for various numbers of reasons. And this thing, but it's okay, it's a tunnel, it's can basically descend into the atmosphere. And unfortunately, what happened when it descended into the atmosphere is about... Um, too soon, again about 40 seconds too soon, basically it just switched its rockets off and it just fell down and just crashed into the surface. The reason it switched its rockets off was because it didn't have the telemetry available from the first thing that it lost to know exactly how high it was, so it had little feeler probes underneath, feeling out, the, feeling out. and for a number of reasons, possibly because there was a storm or possibly one hypothesis is actually as the undercarriage was coming out, the, under, the vibration from the undercarriage told the feeler probes that it had landed, it basically decided to switch itself off and it's ascended and it cratered onto the planet. And that's what it looks like now. And it's been now. Uh... And what's interestingly, there were actually four, two other missions that were lost because this thing also had some really high velocity probes that it was gonna send down into the, into the Mars at the, at the time, uh, two of them that were basically gonna go about a meter, about three feet into the surface, kick up a bunch of rock and do a lot of really, really interesting science based upon the result of that. And all of that got lost, okay? So what can we learn from this? Anticipate. Uh, ported modules, I've talked about this before, think like a pessimist, sod's law. If it can go wrong, it probably will, right? And um, test, simulate edge condition testing. I see so much testing done right now where people test, somebody gives a specification, next person says, well, I'm gonna test that this thing matches the specification that you gave. Yeah, that's kind of cool, but the developers should probably have tested that with some unit tests or something beforehand, right? That should be part of the delivery of that software. Um, a tester's job is to basically test the edge conditions, test the unforeseen. What, what are we doing that's different? What have we not seen before? What happens if I put in garbled data into this? What happens if I stress it? What happens if I try to overflow something? What happens if I, if I smash this thing, if I just crunch it, if I just yank away things that aren't needed? So I work a lot in banking computing right now and high availability, what people call seven nines or eight nines availability. That's how you get that. Right, because you go, what happens if I just grab that bit of hardware and I just pull it out? Right, what happens if I just like take a pen knife and just cut that cooling pipe? Uh, and, and those sort of tests are done. What happens if I, if, I, if I stick that machine and just simulate an earthquake and things like that? Um, that's about it, really. So I guess my conclusion for anybody developing software is um, test, think, understand. Um, because in space, no one can hear your excuses. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any questions? Or... Thank you. Did the audio work? All right. I couldn't get my feedback. 
Any, anybody want to add any of their own stories about awful things that have gone wrong? That you, just, you have that kind of like Ariane face, like I just wasted $7 billion now. You have a question, sir? sir. Yeah, so your question was about the failure in Skylab, which was the session that Sen gave earlier, was um, about the fact that the failure was they didn't keep the source code. Yeah, which is a definite lesson. And it was a little bit of a dig at IBM, I, I felt, there in, in that one. You were just a little, you were just kicking out. That's of, history, man. Yeah, it was. It was. IBM was responsible for, for deleting the source code, probably on instructions from NASA. But, but, there's, but, there's an, but there is an element of, 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 of truth in that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I come across software... Um, especially compiled software. You know, a lot of software languages are, you know, more interpreted, you know, modern languages like Java and Python and, um, you know, TypeScript and JavaScript and things like that, Golang and all those wonderful languages, or perhaps they're compiled down to a, a, a VM like Kotlin or something like that. So it's not that hard to figure out what's gone wrong, even if you have the executable, because it's always jitted, it's always late compiled. But if you look at some of the earlier things written, especially within banking, you have modules written in COBOL or PL1 or something like that, and they're compiled. Not only that, they're compiled with compiler options that you don't know about, because if you don't have the original compile script, you don't actually know how that thing was compiled. Um, yeah, it's, ter it's, it's, it's terrifying. I mean, who, who, did, who here lived through Y2K? There's probably some people who were born. A lot of hands went up. I mean, that was a scary moment. I remember the first software company I joined, and I was working on, it was 1988, when I got my first job, and it was insurance, and we were dealing with the year of, a, of an insurance policy. And we had the expiry date and the start date of the policy, and the way we realized whether it was still current is we just did a math on the two, and it was like a two-bit date. I remember saying, I was like the emperor's new clothes. I was like, you know, but the end of the decade's not that far away. Oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know? And uh, sure enough, yeah, a lot of my friends got very highly paid contracting jobs. Um, yeah, there's another apocryphal story about a bank in Ireland um, and if you visit the bank's headquarters, there's a beautiful wine bar because it's located beautifully in the middle of Dublin. And uh, there's a bit with a brick wall. And that's because they've got some IT running there that they're too terrified to switch off. Uh, it's a DEC PDP-11. Uh, they have a high fiber optic cable uh, link to, to their current site, which is obviously a much cheaper rent, a much easier for people to park and, you know, enjoy lunch and running, you know. But they're too terrified to switch that thing off because it's doing something. They just have no idea. And they think if they do, that'll bring down the entire Irish economy. Yeah. So, and they have no source code or no documentation and nobody living that actually knows what it's for. Um, it might just be a wonderful bluff by the landlord of the wine bar. But, uh, yeah. Any, any more? You have a question? Yes. Uh, me? Um, so, speaking of stories that might be apocryphal, I don't know if you've read The, uh, the Martian by Andy Weir, but there's a scene in there where... Uh, a software engineer is talking to one of the main characters back on Earth, and he's talking about why uh, something that happened with Pathfinder related to a like a priority inversion error, and it was just you know, kind of briefly mentioned in passing. But I was just wondering if you had heard anything about if, if you knew anything about. I that. haven't. I'm going to research that. So thanks. So your question was about the the Martian, which is a phenomenal phenomenal film, isn't it? Well, the book. The book. The Mars Pathfinder priority inversion, I don't know. The one thing that I do know that happened on the Mars Pathfinder was when it landed, everything, everything went wrong. They, what they tried to do was they tried to extract a lot, of the, um, a lot of the arms. This is a wonderful one about management getting in the way. I feel like this is a bit of like kind of, this is how rebellions start, right? Because management wanted to have lots of data early on. So they switched on lots of simultaneous systems. They were opening things and all of those collided. It hadn't been tested before, and they had to rescue that by basically patching the BIOS of something on Mars. Yeah, 
I, 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 there's some story about, but that's excellent feedback. If I ever give this session again, I'll include that one. Yeah. If, if the, I mean, if, if that is actually a real story and not just something that you made up. No, I think it is. I think it's public domain. Um, yeah. Do you have any intel on that? Or? Uh, Great. So the, the feedback was that NASA has it. And presumably, you can just Google for NASA Public Archive or something, and yeah, you're going to find the trusted source. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for those questions. Cool. You guys can go. Clusters missed. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>